Everything that we read throughout Scripture is for spiritual purposes, but natural application. You can't have one without the other. You can't look at Scripture and say this is all natural stuff, but you can't look at it and say it's all super spiritual stuff, because if you take the spiritual things and you don't apply it, Scripture tells us that faith without works is dead. So what that's saying is you can be super spiritual over here and understand it all, but if you don't actually apply it over here in the natural, then it does you no good. But all the time, same while, you can't be over here in the natural and just say, oh yeah, that's all well and good, the big man upset, right? You can't, you can't have one without the other, right? Keep it in balance, America. So we got to learn how to make these two things work together for the good. So now what I want you to understand is that study to show yourself approved. Y'all ever seen who's here is in the medical profession and field. Y'all notice I have on uh, fire and rescue. I'm a medic this morning. You know, I was a, I was a, uh, uh, I was a referee last week, but I'm a medic this morning. That's what we're going to talk about is the medic side of it. But you know, I think if anyone who knows me and I said, hey, I'm totally qualified to be for fire and rescue and to be an EMT, who here believes me? If anybody raises their hand, it's a bad idea. I may have had brain surgery, but I'm not going to do brain surgery. I, I'm not a surgeon, right? Why? I haven't got some qualifications that I need to be able to do those things. And if I'm going to be a medic, you know, the medical profession, you gotta study for like ever. That's why most of us are like, who's a doctor in here? And we're like, nah, 12 years, nah. That ain't for me. Because it takes a lot of studying. It takes a lot of time, effort, and energy. We have nurses in here, and we have people that are in all kinds of different... It takes a lot. you got to know a lot. And man, you're dealing with life and death situations. I don't want that kind of pressure. You know, I did uh, home theater stuff. The worst case scenario is someone couldn't watch Netflix. Even though they thought it was the end of the world, it wasn't. That was the worst case scenario that I dealt with. I don't want to deal with, hey, you know, like... If, if I do this the wrong way, like this dude's dead, like gone. You know, that's, that's, not, that's not a pressure I want. So y'all understand the study to show yourself approved. But I will let you know that that is the pressure we all have, by the way. Because if you remember in our analogy, right, first week one, we had this whole thing out here in the middle and we had the team and I had like 14 volunteers that were all going crazy. I picked a bunch of dudes that are wild and crazy and they tried to kill me and attack me and all that kind of stuff. But what we showed was on the game of life, the field here, you can do it and go against the opposition because we read in Philippians, it says, I press towards the mark of the high call, right? So that means press, that means there's something coming against you, first off. And the second off says high call, which means it's something God's call is better than, and higher than the things that you Thing. And we said that you can get in the game of life and say, I got this. I'm going to figure this out. And we talked about that. I'm just wondering, you know, Taryn read uh, Ephesians 6.10. We talked about Ephesians 6.10 and how you think, and we had, if y'all, y'all remember, I can get them all back up here. We can do it all over again. This time I got the high advantage. Y'all can stay down there. But I had six guys lined up and they all had names on them like depression and anxiety and, and negativity and all these things that come against you to get you off the path, off the mark. And you can go and say, I got this. And you're focused on your anxiety and you think you got it under control. But all the while, the word wiles of the devil, by the way, the devil, Bobby, the word wiles literally means an ambush, something you didn't see coming. So you're focused on anxiety and depression is coming up behind you. And he's about to clothesline you. Yeah. He or she, whatever depression takes its form. <laughs> but you get what I'm saying? That, that was week one. They said, you, I've got this. I'm going to figure this out. And you wrestle all of it by yourself. And you'll never win. But God gave us a team. And that team is actually found in Ephesians 6.10. Because after it talks about that, hey, this battle you're fighting is not natural. It's not in this world. It's not the people beside you. Look at the people beside you and say, you're not the enemy. A lot of us need to look at our spouse right now and say, you are not the enemy. Convince yourself. They are not the enemy. I promise. You're not the enemy. There's not a person on this planet that is our enemy. You know, sometimes in the church we get it misconstrued. and We're like, we're fighting against the enemy of the sinners of the devil. And it's like, no, they're not your enemy. There's this thing that we have to battle inside of us. And then what Scripture shows us in Ephesians 6.10 is that there's this thing that in Scripture is called the armor of God. In a more modern idea, we could understand it as like a team. Because we don't run around wearing armor. Although, if you go to Renaissance Fair, you will see people. But let those people go walk out through Walmart like that and everybody goes. And then like take your kids and walk away this way, right? So it's, we don't understand armor as much, but we do understand the team, right? I used to play basketball. That is one sport I know a little bit about. And you got a team. And you really can't accomplish much without a team. And it's the same thing. So then we got up the whole team. And we talked about the belt of truth and the, and the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness. We did a deep dive into that a while back, so I won't go into all that. But we said, this is the team God gives you. And remember, we paired them up. 
And we said, so if you got depression, you got truth. Because most of all, depression is rooted in a lie. A lie that you're alone. No one loves you. Or you're never going to amount to anything. That's all a lie. And it creates depression. So God gave us truth. Truth is, God says, I got great plans for you. Truth is, he says, I love you. Truth is, he says, you're not alone, right? That, that's the truth of it. And then we looked at, at anxiety. And we looked at peace and how he gives us peace. And we understood that peace is in the process. A lot of times we think peace and we're like, hum, inner peace. Usah. That's not the peace of God. That's not what he's trying to show to us and tell us about peace. Peace is a process thing. It's like, you know what? It all looks like, and can I say it this way? It looks like it's all going to hell in a handbasket. But somehow, some way, on the other side of this, it's all going to come out to be. Because we can't make the mistake of thinking that there's, oh, you get saved. Thank you, Jesus. And life is great. No, I'm actually here to tell you, who wants to sign up for a harder life? That's what Christianity is, because now you have made yourself aware of this whole other battle that's going on. So it ain't easy. It's not rainbows and unicorns and bulletproof marshmallows. It is a rough, tough thing, and you got a team that God gives you to say, hey, we can accomplish this if you stand. And we looked at, last week, we looked at the scripture that talks about the throne of grace come boldly. The word boldly literally means to be after, to come behind. So we stand behind the throne of grace. Let daddy take care of it. Now, that doesn't mean, again, keep it in balance. This is all recap real quick so I can say the two scriptures I need to say. That doesn't mean that you get to go around and say, I read my scripture and I prayed, so God's just going to handle everything for me. No, there's some work to be done. Remember we said that. Study to show yourself approved. All of that was basically a recap. So, in this illustration from week one, we talked about the team. We talked about the refs. Do y'all remember the refs? The refs, at first we said, were religion. And religion says, penalty. you got to go back 10 yards. You screwed up. God does not want to talk to you anymore until you get your life right. Who's ever heard? You better get close to God so you can hear him again. That's true. Get close to God. But God is not the five-year-old on the playground that says, you didn't do it my way, so I'm taking my toys and coming over here. That's not God. God is the guy with his hand out constantly saying, can we just hang out and play together? I got some really cool toys. I know. Y'all like, God, toys? I know. This is just how my mind works. Sorry. So he says... Those are not the refs. Religion, this, this, this hierarchy thing, that's not it. It's really grace and mercy. And we discovered what grace and mercy, they go hand in hand, but they are different things. Grace and mercy. Mercy is this. Mercy is not getting something you may deserve. So a penalty, right? You don't get the penalty. You may deserve it, but I'm not going to give it to you. Grace comes in and says, I'm going to give you something you don't deserve. So they kind of work on opposite ends of the spectrum. Grace comes in and says, you may not, it's not supposed to be your ball. It's supposed to be their ball, but I'm going to give it to you anyways. That's how grace and mercy works together. You don't deserve it. You can't earn it. There's not a good enough play you can do. You can't tackle someone good enough. You can't do the right things tomorrow and read enough scripture and, and study for the long enough amount of time to earn it. That is what calls the play every time. That's what calls the game. That is the, that is the measurement stick is his grace and mercy. Now, we did discuss last week, too, that, well, what about if you give two people too much grace? You're just telling them they can do whatever they want. To an extent, sure, Paul said it that way. All things are permissible, but not expedient. He's saying, I'm not saying you can or can't do something, but man, when you get a hold of the heart of God, when you understand his character, his love and mercy, you can't help but do it the way that he wants to do it. Now, do you get it right all the time? No. I'll use my wife as an example. I don't wake up every morning and I don't have it put on my mirror and says, do not cheat on Taryn today. I don't have to do that. I don't have to have a list of the Ten Commandments to be married to Terrence. She would probably appreciate it if one of them was clean the house or something. But I don't have to have this list. Because I love her and I know her, I begin to look at things the way she looks at things. I begin to see things that I know frustrate her. And again, she's like, oh, I'm writing all this down. Yeah, I may not get it right all the time, but you know what? She doesn't divorce me every morning either. I don't wake up and Terrence said, you didn't do the dishes. And I asked you to do dishes, or I forgot to tell her something this morning. Yeah, coming to church this morning, and I could, I could tell in her voice, I was like, honey, and she was being so kind and caring and not divorcing me for it. She was just being the heart of God, and I said, I totally forgot about this thing, and I need you to run to Walmart and do this whole thing. She's like, well, now I'm going to be late to church, blah, 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 I was like, I know, I'm sorry. She was being so nice and caring. That's more like how the conversation with God, when you come to him, you say, hey, I, I've kind of got a little mess here, and you bring it to him. And then he can say, hey, I can help you out and work on it. But you're bringing it to him just because you want to know him more. You want to you want, you want to inquire of his help. And sometimes we get it mixed up with grace and mercy and judgment and all these things that we got we to gotta make sure that you do all the right things and make sure we remember not to cheat on God. But when you get to know God, you don't really start worrying about those other things. When you, when, you, when you get to know his true character and nature. So that was what we talked about. But in this whole illustration, 
We said, what if someone gets injured on the field? And that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to read you a story and another scripture, and then we're going to move on to what the heart of God. And I want you to hear all this in the spirit. So if you're thinking I'm talking about football or basketball or all these things, you're missing it. This is spiritual understanding for natural application, right? So tomorrow, this is how you apply this to your life. And I think right now, today, the spirit of God is going to speak to some individuals' hearts in here. I don't know who. I don't know how many. I don't know if you're, if you're going to respond or not. That's all between you and God. It's not my place. Not my purpose. My purpose is to serve it, and you can choose to eat it if you want to or not. But I'm going to share this with you, and I hope it speaks to your heart. Can I pray one more time before I share these two scriptures? Thank you. Father, I pray this morning that what I'm about to read and what I'm about to say is inspired by you and you alone. Father God, I pray that only you are seen through this, Father, that I fade to the background and the theatrics fade to the background, and your heart is revealed for our plans and purposes that you have given us. I pray that in your name and everybody said, amen. Amen. And we understood this, that the people, when someone gets injured on the field, that's the job of the church. The church is the medics, okay? The church is the one that when someone gets injured in the game of life, because all this stuff's been coming against them because they didn't know about the team that God gave them because they were told that God didn't give you no team. He's actually the one on the other side. He's coming to hunt you down. We're going to find you. I don't know why that song's stuck in my head. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to come hunt you down. It's like, that's not the truth. God gave you a team. He's on your side. Because if God be for us, who could be against us? And we said the church's job when someone gets injured on the field is to run to them with the stretcher and say, hey, let me get, quick, get you bandaged up. Get you kind of, okay, can we move you now? You're not paralyzed or anything? No, okay, we're going to move you. We got another safer place to go. And that's where the church is. The church is not the building, by the way, okay, guys? We are the medics. We are the church. The word church means a gathering of called out ones. Everybody say hello. Let's look at somebody random that you don't know and say hello. Hello. Say hello, church. We think the word church is like this, it's this building, it's this whole thing that we are a gathering of people who are called out from doing things the normal way. We're called out to do things differently. And what the world does, as we talked last week about grace covering things, grace can't cover something that hasn't been exposed. And what the world does, and that's what human nature is, to say, I see someone hurt and be like, do you know how you got hurt? You shouldn't have ran that play. You shouldn't have done that. Blah, 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 blah. That is how the world does things. And the churches adopted that negatively. We weren't supposed to because we were supposed to come under them and say, hey, let me help you. You already know how you got hurt. I'm not going to tell you the story. Well, could you imagine that? Imagine you're hurt or you go to the hospital, right? Who's ever like done something stupid and got hurt? Every guy in here raises their hand. I was fortunate enough out of all my idiotic stunts of my day, I really never got hurt. I mean, I did have, I guess, a long-lasting effect later, but I never really got hurt. But I did have a friend that got hurt one time. I was at a basketball camp at Baylor University, and we were running up and down the halls in the middle of the night playing, and they had these big metal doors. I mean, they cut your finger off, and that's exactly what happened. We're all running around playing, and the coaches kept saying, y'all better get in the bed. And, you know, they'd come up, hey, and now they're like, and they'd be like quiet, and then they'd leave, and we'd poke our heads out and go. And my buddy, my roommate that we were in, we were all running around and playing, and he had his finger in the door, and coaches come in, and everybody runs, and boom. I mean, his finger was just like, whoop, hanging there. Could you imagine if when he went to the doctor, they are like, so what were you doing? Do you understand why? Could you imagine if that was what the doctors were like? His finger's just hanging there. He's like in pain. And the whole time the doctors and the nurses are like, well, you know, if you hadn't been playing in that hallway, this would have never happened. If you hadn't put your finger inside that door, you knew that was, you knew you shouldn't have been doing that in the first place. If that's what the doctor did, wouldn't we all say, get me another doctor? And that's what the world's saying. Can I get another church, please? I hope y'all heard that in the spirit. Can I get another group of called out people? Because they ain't helping my issue here. Okay, I'll leave that alone. But we're supposed to come to them, pick them up, and take them. Now this building, this place is like the hospital. Does a hospital do any good without any medics? Again, I I don't even like this show because I have nightmares about zombies. But I do know that in The Walking Dead, the first scene, the dude's in the hospital, right? Spoiler alert, if you haven't watched this, I guess. But I watched one episode and I had nightmares for like... Live. I'm not kidding. I'm 30 years old and I'm like, nope, no zombie movies for me because I wake up and I'm ready to fight, throw grenades, like all kinds of stuff. But in the, in the movie, he's in the hospital, but guess what? There's no medics in the hospital. It does you no good. It does you no good. So we're the medics. The hospital is this. This is the hospital. It's a place set up to help do some surgery. 
And then what that surgery is, is to let the presence of God be here. That's why we put so much emphasis and pressure on keeping this particular room always dedicated and set up for a surgery. You know, when I don't even know, again, I don't know, why does God keep having me use analogies I know nothing about? I don't know about football or being a doctor. And I'm using both of these simultaneously. I hope y'all are seeing that. Like, this is, this is ridiculous. So, what? a surgery room stays the way it is. You don't go into a surgery room and say, hey, I'm going to have lunch real quick on the table. Boom! That's right. That's right. Yeah, I'm going to move this limb out the way real quick. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. You, you keep that. They sterilize that thing. They keep it pristine. And as a matter of fact, if you're, you're not even really allowed in there sometimes if you're not a part of the medical staff. You get to watch through a window. Now, that's not what we're doing here and be like, oh, are you a part of the, the team today? No, the worship team's going to sing alone. Y'all stay out there. We'll have a viewing room. No, that's not what we're talking about. But the idea that we set this place up to say, surgery's going to happen here. We're not the ones doing the surgery, though. The Spirit of God is the one going to come and work on people's hearts and fix things. I mean, we sang it today. You're here mending the hearts. You're here doing those things. We're just here to say, scalpel, here you go. Say this. Okay. Why? Just do it. Okay. Oh, oh, I see why. Could you, I mean, you get what I'm saying. That's how the spirit works, and that's what this place is. But we got to go get them off the field first. Mend them a little bit right then and there, and then take them on. Now, we have a really great scripture for this. This is in Luke 10, 25. We're going to read it together here. Um, I'm going to read it in the King James Version, and then I'm going to give you the International Jared Version, which is a little bit more in our lingo, in our day, in our time. So this story right here that happens. Jesus is telling us this story. I'm going to give you a little bit of preface. Jesus is talking to a group of people, okay? Jesus is a pretty smart dude. Just going to let you know that right now. He has a way with words. He's a wordsmith beyond us, and he knows exactly how to say it and when to say it. He taught the disciples this, so when we read the rest of Scripture, we can see some of that same spirit coming out in the disciples because this is how Jesus was. So Jesus is talking, and here's what happens. Let's read it, and then I'll translate it for you, okay? Verse 25, and it says, Behold, a certain liar, I mean lawyer, stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, he's talking to Jesus. He said, Master, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Verse 26, and Jesus said, What is written in the law? How readest thou? Verse 27, and he answered, saying, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and love thy neighbor as themselves. And Jesus said, Thou hast answered right. Do this, and thou shalt live. So do what the scripture said. You're good. Verse 29. But he, willing to justify himself, said to Jesus, All right, who's my neighbor? Verse 30. Jesus answered him and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of all of his raiment, or garment is that word, and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Verse 31, and by chance there came a certain priest that way, and he saw him, and he passed on the other side of the road. Like that guy that was in the armor at Walmart. So he ran to the other side of the road. Verse 32, and likewise, a Levite was at the same place, came and looked on him, and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, this is verse 33, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Verse 34, and went to him, bound his wounds, pouring oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, so set him on his own horse or, you know, whatever he was riding, camel, whatever, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Verse 35, and when the, in the morrow, so the next day, he had departed and he took two pence. The word there, pence, is the word denarian. I can't, if I'm pronouncing that right, it was the currency of the day of, of Greece, Okay. He took two pence, two denarian, and gave it to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatever you spend more, I will come back again and repay you. And then Jesus asked this question. This is, isn't it? Jesus answers a question with a question every time. Someone's trying to catch him, and he's like, let me ask you a better question. And here's the question he asks in verse 36. He said, Now which of these three do you think was the neighbor unto the man who fell to the thieves? And verse 37, he said, being the guy who asked, he that shows mercy on him. And Jesus answered and said, go and do likewise. Go and do this. Now, can I break this story down? Who's heard the story of the Good Samaritan? 
right? Outside of even church culture, people say, oh, he was just a good Samaritan. This story has resonated for so long throughout history about a good Samaritan. There's a couple of things we need to understand. I get volunteers this morning, too. I love doing illustrations. All right. Who wants me to pick on them? Mike? Albie? Jonathan? I need one more. Who wants to be my hurt guy? Little lady? All right. Little lady can be the hurt guy or lady. Actually, no, you'll be the priest. I'd rather pick on Mike. All right. He's already got a bum leg, so. All right, here's what we got. Can y'all line up right over here? Annalise, you line up first. Albie, and then, and then uh, I'll be the, the thief. <laughs> no, no, you're going to be down here. So this is the road. Mike's on his way. He's going to pick some peaches or something. This is the road. There's a ditch on either side. Some guys see him. He's like, man, I like that shirt. So he, they decide they, they beat him up. All right. They jump him, beat him up. They hurt him. They stab him. They whatever him. They take all of his awesome bracelets and his cool swagger. They take it off. And then they kick him off to the side of the road. Just lay like you're like half on the road. No, no, way over here. Like right here. Yeah, yeah, right here. In the ditch. You know, no, not on the ditch. You sit down here. Yeah, there you go. Doesn't he look like he's posing for a glamour shot right now? Like, oh, he needs a little bit of makeup. And... So he's hurt. He's injured. He's off to the side. I run off with all of his stuff. Okay? He's hurt and injured on the field. And a priest comes by. Okay? A priest of the Jewish culture. That would be the equivalent of a pastor. Comes by and sees him. Walk with me. Sees him and says... I don't actually, I hope you're hearing this spiritually, you're all hearing this. I don't want to be held accountable because I know I'm supposed to do that. So I'm going to walk over here and act like I didn't see it. I'm going to go to the other aisle because I didn't want to see that person in the grocery store. I'm going to, I don't really want to do it. You, you see what the priest did. Just stand right there for a second. The priest was walking and saw it and said, I don't want to be held accountable for it. So I'm going to walk the other way and act like I didn't even see it. That's what the priest did. Go ahead and sit down for me. The next one comes and says to Levi. Levi is a part of the tribe of Israel, which is also from the Levitical priesthood, which means a similar one. Yeah. This one comes like this. Come on, Albie. Oh, I need one. No, I don't. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> Counting is hard, guys. The Levite comes, though. He comes by, and it says he looks on him. So the dude's reaching up, and he's like, yeah, how about no? <laughs> and he keeps going. This person saw knew and said, why'd you end up in the ditch in the first place? And then kept on walking. Thank you, Albie. You can sit down. But then this, this other one, the Samaritan comes. We go, oh, isn't it good that we made the unicorn? We made him the Samaritan. Well, Jonathan here, he's the Samaritan. There, there's something you need to understand about Samaritans in Jewish culture. Samaritans were not just like another nation. What they actually were was a group of Jewish people. Okay? that actually decided they had some different belief systems than the original Jewish culture. They believed they had the original one. The Jewish people believed they had the original one. So they fought and argued over their belief system as to who had the right beliefs. I hope you're hearing this about like denominations and all this stuff. So they argued over this all the time. So the fact that Jesus said, this person that's about to come, I mean, they didn't know that Samaritan was about to do the right thing. He's trying to show them this person that's about to do the right thing. You disagree theologically with them. But watch them be the one that I say set the example of because they had the heart of God. Watch what he does. So the Samaritan, the Samaritan, the Samaritan comes, he sees him, he picks him up out of the ditch. Now lay down like a stretcher. He lay down like a stretcher. Act like you're bandaging his wounds. He gives him back his swagger, right? He starts fixing him up and bandaging him up. Not, don't take off his shirt, jeez. He begins... To mend his wounds right here where he's at. As he's mending his wounds, it says that he pours oil and wine. What he's doing, he's refreshing him. He's making sure. And then he puts him on his own horse or his own camel. He picks him up because the dude can't do it. You act like you're picking him up. And puts him on a horse. He was the one that was riding high and nice. And <laughs> I just thought you were doing gangdom style for some reason. <laughs> He was the one on the horse. The Samaritan owned it. It was his. But he said, you know what? I'll walk the whole way. I'll put this dude in my place. Doesn't sound like a man named Jesus who did that for us later on. 
He says, I'll, I'll walk in your place. You get on the horse. I'll take it. And he walks him all the way. And it says when he walks him, I'm going to go sit down now. Thank you, guys. It says when he walks him all the way on his beast, he gets to the city and he takes him to an inn. Or can we just say like a place, like a hotel type place where they would keep people. And he keeps them there and he gives them these two denarii. Now, I want to do a breakdown because sometimes what we always think is we say, oh, two, like he gave him a couple bucks, 20 bucks. A denarian was the price of a skilled laborer for the day. A skilled laborer of the day. So he gave him two full days worth of work. So take your paycheck, whatever you make, and then divide it by however many days you work, and you're gonna give them two days worth of your income. Skilled labor today would roughly make around $400. So he gives them about 800 bucks. To a man he doesn't know, he had no, he didn't need to, he didn't have to, he already helped him up, he could have helped him up and said, you, you good the rest of the way? All right, you take care of it. I'm glad I could help you bandage your wounds. He didn't leave him there. He didn't just bandage the wounds. He didn't just say, now, can you walk with me? And I'll, I'll take you there if you follow me. No, he said, let me put you on. The, I'll take all the, you just sit here. You can use my stuff. You can take my stuff. I'm going to take you there. So he goes and he takes him, takes him to the inn. When he sets him at the inn, he doesn't even just leave him there. He says, all right, you're in a city. You're in a place. Y'all know what the inn is in this story, right? It's the church, the building, the medic, the building. He takes him there. And he didn't just say, all right, I got you there. Hey, pastor, this dude needs some help. You got it? And run off. No, he said, hey, I'm going to take care of him. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do whatever it takes. So he gives him the money. He said, because I got I to gotta go. Who knows? Maybe he was going to find another dude that's just been jumped. And he's like, I got to go, but I'm going to give you the money. And he said, if it even takes longer, I will come back. And I will ensure that every debt is taken care of. Jesus shows this story, and then the guy says, oh, the guy who showed mercy. Now, after that, we hear the story about Jesus going, and we hear the story of Mary and Martha that happens right after this. But this parable that Jesus tells us paints us a perfect picture of the church as a medic. Because what it shows us is you can know all of it. And you think just because you didn't happen to, oh, well, I just didn't run into him this week, so I guess that word wasn't from God, or, you know, I guess I just, and you go the other way, it doesn't matter how much you know, you can go and look on it and run right past it. What Jesus shows is you're supposed to be the medic, you're supposed to see the injury on the field, look for the injury on the field, go to the injury on the field, help them right where they're at, before you pick them up and take them off, help them right where they're at, help them there. Put them on there and take them somewhere where they can be taken care of properly, but you're going to help them make sure they get along the way. This is what we would call a relationship. Amen. And it says, that, hey, I'm going to make sure that they're good along the way while they're at the end, and then I'll come back and keep, keep checking on them. Make sure he's good till he's nursed, fully back to health and back on his way. Now, this is the understanding of the church being a medic, the church, and what our ministry is supposed to be. We're not supposed to be the ones that run around it because it's easier. Can I tell you something? Anybody ever heard that, you know, oh, the law was so impossible and difficult to handle. So Jesus came and made it so much easier. The dude made it harder. I know you're like, this is not a good sales tactic. I know, right? It's like, don't you want to buy this? You have to put it all together yourself. If Ikea said that, no one would buy Ikea. If Ikea showed up pictures of their instructions, no one would want one. <laughs> I ain't trying to false sell you. Jesus made it harder because he came. Here, here's a good example real quick. And then I'll, I'll wrap up with my last little things because I'm going to show you something. And then we'll be moving on here. But Jesus came and had a similar conversation to this with some Pharisees. Can I, can I just be real with you real quick? The Pharisees are talking to him. The, what a Pharisee is is basically church going folk. Oh, you guys. And he comes to him and says, all right. Should we obey all the law? I'm paraphrasing this. And Jesus says, yeah, all the law. He says, well, what about, you know, Scripture says and the law says that, that uh, you know, if you lust after a woman, if you commit adultery, then you're, you're guilty of the law. And Jesus says, yeah, they may say that. I say it to you this way. If you even look, you've already done it. Now, we misinterpret that to say, oh, no, you better not look at any woman and blah, 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 blah. Uh, let me share with you this translation. Because again, Jesus holds us to a different standard. 
It's a standard of the heart. It's a standard that no man can measure, but he can. It's the measure of something that says, I see someone hurting and my heart goes out for them. I want to run to them. I don't want to walk away from them because it's easier. It's much easier to chunk some money in the plate and say, didn't y'all do a good job at helping those people? Than it is to say, I'm going to get down there and dirty with them with the weirdos with the armor on while they're in the Walmart parking lot. And I'm going to be there with the nasty kids and all this and that and the other. That's much harder, much less glorifying because you know what? No one said, the Samaritan is here. He helped them. This one individual. There was no giant crowd. He did it and went on his way. No one would have been the wiser. That's what Jesus called us to. He called us to restore people, to reconcile people. And in this story where the guy is saying, hey, 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 what about looking at a woman and, you know, you, know you, you commit adultery. That's when you're guilty of sin. Do you want to know why they were asking this question? Again, isn't this just like some of us to try to justify ourselves? Because in that day, I don't know if you knew this, in that day and in that culture, your wife was your wife. And you could have other things that were not your wife as long as they weren't married to someone else. Maybe I should have sent the kids out for this one, but parents have a fun conversation. So you have your wife, but if this other woman's not married, it was totally permissible because she's not married. She doesn't belong to anybody because back then women were property. I know, thank God women's live, all that great kind of stuff. But back then women were. So it was totally fine. That was not in violation of the law. That was not adultery because... He wasn't another man. She wasn't another man's wife. That was permissible. You're like, wait, what? Yeah, in that day and in that culture, it was. Because men died all the time in war. So there was a whole lot more women than there was men. And so they're like, ah, this is okay. But then there was even this other group of people that said, well, if she's married, but she's not in your tribe, then it's okay. Do you see? They were trying to justify themselves. So they come to Jesus. Jesus is a part of this culture. He knows what they're talking about. And he says, I'll put it to you this way. If she, if she ain't your wife, if you just look on it like that, you already got a wrong heart motive. So let's fix the heart motive. We took that and said, so don't look. Don't do anything. No. Jesus was trying to call us to a higher standard. Now, that's just one example. You could go over and over and over because when it comes to grace and mercy, it's a lot harder to forgive and give grace and give mercy and then keep working on it and then take somebody and keep holding their hand and helping them along. Can I tell you how many conversations? That's like with your kids. You tell them once and you run away. You're like, all right, I told you, you better grow up. I know you're only five, but you better handle it. And then you walk off. That's not the intent behind it. And Christ calls us to this, this thing. Everybody across this place say, I'm a minister. I'm a minister. Like, no, I'm not. I don't stand up there. Yes, you are. We all are in the ministry. Yes. Did you know that? The word ministry is this. That example, by definition, is ministry. Let me show you this last scripture, and then, then we'll move on. This is in 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5, we're going to read verse 11 through 21. I know it's several, but it's... Uh, did I say 2 Corinthians? Did I write that down wrong? I did. One second. Oh, no, I didn't. See, backing up, Mike. If you back up too far, you forget where you started. <laughs> That's what happens to me sometimes, guy. guys. Guys, uh, I'm a firm believer, by the way, when you read a scripture, always back up. Sometimes you back up so far, you're like, what was the original intent? What I was reading again? So I apologize for that. So let's look at this right here, okay? Verse 16 is actually where we're going to start. I recommend you back up to verse 11, but we're going to start at verse 16. Therefore, we know no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, now we know him more that way. No more that way, sorry. So we don't know him that way anymore. So we knew Christ in the flesh. We saw him in the flesh. But now we know him a different way. We don't know him in that flesh way anymore. We know him in this other way. And here's why. Verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things pass away, and behold, all things are become new. Verse 18, and all things are of God of he who have reconciled himself to Jesus Christ and has given and he has been given to the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, to with that God was in Christ, 
reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, or committing um, unto us the, the wor- word of, rec- and now committing unto us the word of reconciliation. Verse 20, and now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God beseeched you by us, we pray in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. For he was made sin for us who knew no sin, that we may be made the righteousness of God. Now, can I translate all of that? I even get mixed up with my, with my words as I'm reading some King James. And thou shalt not to this and that. Blah, blah, blah. Here's what this is trying to share with you. It says, listen, you shouldn't look at any man after the flesh. The word flesh just means in the natural. So you shouldn't look at any person in the natural. Because when you look at a person in the natural, guess what you're going to see? You're going to see the belly. You're going to see all of the things that are wrong with them. Because when you look in the natural, man, okay. Y'all have to participate. Y'all promise to be honest. Who says, I hate people? (laughs) Isn't that the greatest tactic of the enemy? You can't do the ministry that it just said, which is to reconcile people if you don't like them. Why do we not like them? Well, because they're this. And because they're that, and because they sing off key, and because they did this, and because, did you see that tattoo, or did you, and they said that, and did, uh, bleh, bleh, bleh. Bleh. that's what we see, and that's what the enemy has tried to, 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 to make us just see the natural, because when you look at them in the natural, you will instantly be turned off, you'll instantly say, I don't want to help them, I don't have to help them, I'm better than, the... I'll leave all that alone. So we don't know him after the flesh because we knew Christ that way. We saw him in the flesh, but now we see him in this whole other light, this whole new way. And this is what it says. So if any man be in Christ, he becomes this new creature. All these old things pass away. We can't get it mistaken. The old things passing away, the injuries, all the hurts and all the pains, those cannot pass away without someone nursing them back to health. We can't be the guy that looks on them in the state they're in and says, you're not in Christ yet. Fix it. We pick them up out and we fix it. That's the church's job. We're the medics running out into the field. And then we bring them into this place. Can I share this with you? This is the hospital. The altar is the surgery room. That's what the intent of an altar is for. Is to say, hey, now I'm getting out the way. Church people, we can all learn this. I'm now getting out of the way. And I'm going to let you and God. There's no one between you and the surgeon now. I'm going to let him start to work on you. I'm going to make sure you're okay in the process. I'm going to make sure that everybody... I'm going to stand right there beside you and hold your hand. You say, well, I don't want to do that for some rando. No, because if you're looking at them in the natural, that's exactly... You're just going to see the natural. It says, don't look at people that way because Christ made us new. We should look at everyone else that way and say, how do I get them to this place to where these hurts and pains can pass away? Now... God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, okay? You need to understand what this word reconcile means. This word reconcile means to change or to exchange something. So he says, now I have changed the world and exchanged it for something else. Can I tell you what that something else was? It's called the kingdom of God, the way God does things. He says, I took that thing, I exchanged it for my kingdom, and I put my kingdom in your heart. The way I would do things was through grace and mercy and love, care and take for them, bring them up out of it, and yes, spend your time, your precious thing, your denarii. Not necessarily money, I was using that as an example, because money is what we normally deem as most precious, but if I say, you know, hey, if you work, more hours and get paid the same amount, wouldn't you say that now your time is worth less? So time is actually the most valuable thing you can have. And we have taught, and I'm sorry, I know this sounds a little preachy and then I'm going to wrap it up here. But we've taught people that just give your money to the church and then we'll take care of it. And God says, that is not the purpose of it. The purpose of it is to have your heart in it. Because when your heart's in it, you won't, you won't want to want to walk away from it. When you look at people in the right way, you'll start to see that that's what I'm called to do. And you won't like it, fair warning. I'm pretty sure the, 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 the Samaritan was not singing zippity doo zippity zippity-day. I got to spend my money on somebody I don't know. He was probably like... God, I'm late for this, and I don't want to. You know, fine, hurry up. And, and in the process, he began to see somebody for not who they were, not what happened to him. All of a sudden, he began to see a whole new life spread out of that. 
Because if he was half dead and left there, the odds are he would have died. Or if he had lived, he may have been crippled. I hope you're hearing that in the spirit. We are called to the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of an exchange. Exchanging hurts, pains, and injuries for love, grace, and mercy. Exchanging those things together with them. Right there on the field of life throughout your day while you're working at your job, while you're anywhere. Taking the time and say, I'm going to push the pause button, pump the brakes a little bit, Ricky Bobby. And I'm going to get down on there. And I'm going to help them out. And I'm going to see them through it. And I'm going to introduce them to this thing called the Spirit of God. And I'm going to let Him start to do the work on it. And I'm going to, ooh, don't slip. Uh, and I'm going to let Him do the work on it. And I'm going to come back and check on you. Okay. Matthew 13. I do want to read one more scripture. I know. I'm sorry. No, I'm not. Uh, Matthew 13. Verse 15. That is our ministry. That is our job. We are the medics. We can't be the ambulance that's driving past all the hurt people because we need to get back to the shop. We need to look for them. Go find them. That is the church's job. So when you step into here, you're in university right now, guys. That's what this is. That's what's happening right now. You're going through your training every Sunday morning, Wednesday night. Anytime we get together and we're sharing scripture and we're talking about it is we are sharpening ourselves to say, I am studying this thing to learn how to become this thing. I am going to get my degree. I am going to learn how God wants me to handle these things and do these things. I'm going to learn how to do that. This is university. Welcome to Ardent University. That's what we're doing. We're, we're, We're working on trying to understand to where we can be qualified to be able to help because then you'll know how to help somebody. Because if you see someone hurting, the excuse is not, I don't know how to help because that Samaritan didn't know how to help. He only knew how to do X, Y, Z things. He said, well, I'll take them somewhere where they do know how, and I'll keep learning in the process. We're in university every Sunday, every Wednesday to learn this thing, to understand this thing, so we know how to help people. And it all starts with this right here, which I find so fitting. And if I... I choke up while I'm reading this is because things started going through my head when I first read this scripture uh, on an accident. <laughs> Again, I was, I was looking for another scripture and then I ran across this one. Um, and in Matthew 13, it goes along with what they were saying. And no one else knew that this scripture was in, is in my scripture. I mean, I, I think I, I mentioned it to, to Mike and Steph. I said, there's a scripture at the end that I want to read that I, I think should just shift our hearts. Uh, and, and minds, and that was about the extent of what I said to them. So uh, I want you to hear this because this is the beginning of where you learn to start looking at people this way and how to see people the way God sees people so we can become the medics and the church the way that we were intended to be to go out, find them, help them, get them up, and then bring them to the surgery table, to the altar, and let God start to work on them. Is this right here? Verse 15 in, in Matthew 13. The people's hearts have waxed gross and their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes they have closed. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their hearts and should be converted and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. For verily I say to you, many prophets and righteous men have desired to see these things, and they have not seen them. And to hear these things which you have heard, and they have not heard them. What is this trying to tell us? This is Jesus talking, by the way. Jesus is saying, listen, people, you guys, us. Your ears are waxed gross. You need to clean them out. There's wax in your ears. Okay? I mean, that's, that's... my little redneck definition of it. You've, you've cluttered it up. You've made it complicated. You've, you've cluttered it up so you, you can't hear. You're not hearing anymore. You're blind. You shut your eyes. You notice it didn't say like, oh, you can't see. It's just you shut your eyes. You went to the other side of the path. You shut your eyes. But if you would open your heart, clean it out, expose it. If you would open your eyes, if you'd clean out your ears a little bit, get, get, get some clarity for it. He says, then, then I can heal you. This is the process of the altar. 
is all the while while we're administering reconciliation, this exchange to people, and we're trying to work with them to help show them the grace and love and mercy of God and his glory and power and honor and everything that he is. As you're doing that, it says when you put him before then, then he'll, he'll reach out and do the healing. The final healing factor is not ours to do. That's his. We're just to show them, to help mend them on the field, and then get them off the field for a bit. Sometimes it's the people that have been playing the game. You say, so this doesn't just have to do with the people out in the world. Sometimes it has to do with every single one of us who've been in the game for a while. We know that we got a team, but we're not calling the right plays, maybe, or this and that and the other. And we get injured on the field, but sometimes we got to get off the field. Let the rest of the team handle it for a little bit so you can get back out there and get strong. Because guess what? Then they're going to need, they're going to get injured on the field. That's why you have to have a team with some depth to the bench, right? Because if someone gets hurt, you just put it in another play. Just keep it going, keep it going. That's how the kingdom of God says, well, boom, pick him up off the field. You, you're, you're, you're healing up. It's fine. But to heal up, this is what we have to do. Because it says this right after that. It says, blessed. The word blessed means empowered, to prosper, and succeed, which means it can be grand, it can be bigger, you can see more, you can understand more. It says, so blessed are your eyes. Also, be grateful for that, because blessed are your eyes and your ears. And I, this is the part that just got me, and we have to remember this. Because it says, there are many, many prophets and righteous men that desire to see what you've seen, that are desiring to hear the words that you've heard, that are desiring these things, but they haven't and you have. What are these things? Blessed are your eyes because you've seen what God's done. And there's many other people, there's people in the world right now that are righteous, it's telling you. They're, they're righteous people, they're, they're God's people. They're prophets of God and they are desiring right now to see the hand of God move and you should be thankful and grateful because you've seen it move. You've seen it in the past. Don't forget it. And it says, in your ears, you've heard the voice of God. You've heard it speaking to you. Don't forget that it was clear at one point. To, to be able to start the healing process, you've got to start with gratefulness and thankfulness and say, hey, I'm going to expose myself to the presence of God and let him start to deal with my hurts, pains, and my anxieties, all of these other things that we battle that he gave us this team for. We've got to be able to say, I've been injured, though. I can't call the play right now. I need to come and lay down on the stretcher, on the surgery table, and you better make sure you tell the doctor everything you had to eat before, right? Think of that for a minute. When the doctor comes and says, hey, what's been going on here real quick? Even though the doctor knows what he's about to do, God knows, but it's about exposing it because in that process of exposing it and letting go of all of that stuff, you start to remember, you know what? There was that time when this happened. Just yesterday, uh, we were talking Someone said, I don't really know if it was God or, or, or not, but it's a good thing. I said, I think we're better off just saying every good thing is of God and giving him the glory for it, even if it wasn't God. And if it was just something that just happened in the natural, I'd rather say it was God to ensure that my heart stays grateful and thankful. And when you lay down on that surgery table and says, hey, that, that anxiety that's been eating away at you, that depression that's been eating away at you, I can help you with it. But before I do, I need you to expose it. So where I can begin, and we got to let our eyes and ears be open to remember what God's done and who He is. Because sometimes in the process of, of helping other people, maybe, or in the process of playing the game, we got injured and we kept trying to play and we just made it worse. And now we have this whole wrong perspective of the whole thing. We can't think the coach doesn't care about us. We think all oh, this is right, it's wrong because he's keeping us in the game while we're hurt. And you think the weight's too much, but it's because you can't call a play. you got to come before, get on the stretcher, lay it down. Just like we were singing this morning. But remember, your eyes have seen things God has done. You may say, well, God, I haven't done very much to me. Just go back a little bit. It doesn't take much. I'll help you out. Everybody go. Go back one second. You just breathe. Start there. If that's where you got to start, start there. Then you can back up and say, well, I've been breathing all morning. Then you can back up and say, you woke up. Then you can even back up and say, well, I've got kids. Sometimes that may not be a thing for them. No. But think, I got healthy kids. When you start to remember that you've seen the goodness of God, you can start to find it in the future and you know how to look for it. And you, then you know how to administer it to other people. Yes, yes. Because then you're not saying, oh, woe is me. While you're trying to help the hurt person, you're like, well, let me get down here with you. Because 
<sighs> this is a lot more rest just to be down here. Oh, it's so horrible. I wish someone would come and help me. Don't get down there with it. You'll do that if you're not keeping gratefulness and thankfulness in your heart. If you're not laying at the altar and coming, that's why everything says, come boldly before the throne of grace, come behind that grace, and then everything says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Because I know most of you personally. And I know that at the beginning of this long journey since March, we were all on cloud nine. While everybody else was freaking out, we were totally fine. Now everybody else is kind of coming out of it. We're like, I'm so tired of this. Can we get some relief? And God's like, yeah. Lay down. Let me help you. But it's going to take exposing your heart. It's going to take letting it go. It's going to take doing the very thing that the enemy tries to get us to stop doing. And the enemy being, yes, it can be demonic, but it can also just be the enemy within ourselves. There's been more of attack right now to keep the people of God right now from thanking him and praying to him and talking to him, and communicating to him because he wants to keep you busy. He wants to keep you busy and occupied with other things because if we can keep you busy and occupied with other things, you'll never discover the heart of God. I'm telling you right now, I'm the one up here supposed to be teaching and helping you guys, and I didn't feel like praying at all this week. No matter how I was excited about painting my body and all the fun stuff, and I love the scripture, just like, I don't want to drive to Dallas and pray. I want to listen. To, I want to do. I want to. I, I just want to do something else. I don't want to just sit here in the quiet and and, and just wait because there's things that got to be done. That's what the enemy's trying to do to each and every one of you right now. The reason that we are all somewhat, to some extent, feeling burdened and oppressed and stressed and laid down is because we haven't laid down. We haven't said, all right, God, your wisdom, your way, your guidance. That's our ministry, is to be the medics to the world and to bring them in here to the surgery table. And let God do it. Now, I say in here. It's not always physically in here. Y'all are aware the presence of God exists out there. So that surgery table could happen on the fly because they may have a medical emergency. And they're going to do it in the EMT van while they're driving. Y'all are aware. I am not saying that it only can happen right here at this stage. But I'm saying to bring them to God and let him begin to do that. But keep checking. Keep the relationship. Keep working on That's what we're called to. But if we're ever going to do what God's called us to do, we've got to get on the table ourselves and say, work on this first. 